Go on. I looked up ready to go, I think, or? Yeah, I wasn't sure he was coming, so. Selling them, people are buying them.
we'll say it two or three times probably today, but happy Mother's Day. We have two mothers in the room, and I'm not sure how many mothers might already be on the live stream or watching this. My mother might be on there. And my dad's mother, she watches frequently, most of the time, I think. Silence your cell phones as we prepare for our Romans chapter 8 study. Here we are. Oh, that's not social distancing right there. It's okay, they live together. Yes. They already shear germs. Family units may sit together. And and units? If we all live in the same house. Yeah, if you're already in the same house together, then. Hey, Jill, you can get a picture like this. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Socially distanced by clumps. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> clumping. clumping. Romans chapter 8. Yeah. All right. And we have a few people. How many people we have online joining us yet? Uh, Brad, let me check. You can't. I thought it showed on there. Uh, it shows how many. Okay, I think it's six. six. Seven. It is seven. Sorry. Well, so, that's a nice little oh. group to get started. It's about to be eight. Chris, Denisa, Ruby, Frank, and your mom. Hi, Happy mom. Mother's Day, Mom. Yeah. I'll try to call you later. Aww. Call and talk to her. We haven't visited any of our family since this thing started. If uh, any of them get corona and die, they're not going to be able to blame me. <laughs> All right, let's get into Romans chapter 8, and uh, we'll get started. Brother Pedro, it's great having you and Bethany here. Brother Pedro, uh, open study with prayer if you don't mind. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for giving us the ability to fellowship together and to be able to preach your word and exhort everybody. And please give everybody here the ability to share what they know on this Bible study. And later on, when Greg preaches, the word will come out from you, and we know more from you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That is the point. All right, we're in uh, Romans 8, and uh, I had intended on bringing my big old giant print Bible again. This, I'm, I love this uh, Bible that I use on my uh, little tablet, but I'm, I'm getting way too much time on screens, and it's bad for the... I already have, only have one good eye, and it's already had issues. So I'm going to try to cut down on the amount of screen time. But this morning I went off and left it out of habit because I've been using this for a while. But uh, hopefully it'll keep working. We're in Romans chapter 8. I use this little blue shade thing i got to turn off when I'm up here. Um, we uh, finished chapter 7 last week and of course remind you that if you missed any of our previous Roman studies, they're all available on YouTube at our YouTube channel. If you uh, forget 
or need a link, you go to bbfwire.com and it's right there on the front page. The link to our channel and instructions on how to subscribe so you'll get your notifications. We uh, turn the live stream on five to ten minutes ahead of time. And that gives everybody time to get the notifications. There's still people that don't get them for, you know, 10, 15 minutes after, you know, a half hour after we go live. That's good for you too. So uh, I know Earl Dressel out in Arizona has been having that problem. So let's get into Romans chapter 8 now, and uh, I'm going to introduce the first verse we read as one of the most abused texts in the Bible. You know, see why as we uh, start, but read just verse 1 with me. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It may surprise you to know that if you followed along, um, in our previous studies, um, why that thing is jumping like that, I don't know. But uh, we uh, have seen that uh, the application of the law is to show you your need of salvation. Not, uh, we don't come in here and preach, you know, you keep the law and maybe if you're good enough, you'll make it to heaven. <laughs> And as crazy as that sounds, that's what the false religions teach. <laughs> and then some of them make up their own law. But uh, it's some form of law that you have to keep uh, in order to be saved and right with God. And uh, let's look back just one chapter, how we ended there in chapter 7. And he's, he has turned to the fact that we are delivered, verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he tells you who in verse 25. Read that with me. I, I thank God, God through Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord. Lord. So then, then with the mind, mind I myself, myself serve, serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. sin. That's speaking in your sin nature. You just naturally tend towards sin. It may not be rape or murder. How many of you talk to people and say, oh, I think I'm going to heaven. I mean, it's not like I've raped or killed anybody. <laughs> you really set a high standard for yourself there, pal. <laughs> you know? Uh, but you, you, you serve yourself. You make yourself your own little God. You're lost. That's what it means to be lost. You're just doing what you think you want to do, what you think, well, I think. When someone starts out with that answer, you know you're in trouble. Well, are you going to heaven? Well, I think... Uh, that's a bad place to start. Because Paul says, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. With the mind, I, myself, serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And so if Paul's dealing with this, I think the rest of us would hopefully admit that we're all dealing with the same thing. Mm -hmm. On some level. Amen. Then the first verse starts with, there is therefore... <clears throat> What's that mean? It means it's there for this reason. You have to build on what you just read. I point this out because I'm not one of those guys who say, it's a shame we have chapter and verses. Those weren't in the original. Well, number one, you've never seen the original. Number two, I'm glad they're here because I would not be able to find my way through the Bible. Yeah, it'd be impossible. <laughs> yeah, and can you imagine trying to have congregation? You'd all have to come in and had the last study, that would be, maybe that wouldn't be, I'm, now I'm thinking maybe oh. that wouldn't be such a bad idea. You, number one, all the churches would probably tend toward expository study, so they'd know where they left off the, the last <laughs> week. Instead of just jumping around and preaching on whatever, you know, the Lord is, you know, it's always giving, or church attendance, or whatever, the Lord has led me to. Instead, it's pick up where you left off, but that's what you'd have to do if you didn't have chapter and verses. But the flip side of that is yeah. that because we have chapter and verses, people tend to ignore the context of verse 1, at least. They ignore where it came from. I used to do that a lot myself and uh, seeing different things. And it's like, wait a minute, this looks like... And uh, you just got to remember that they didn't have chapter and verses. Yeah. We should be glad we have them. Like yes. As long as you're keeping it in the larger context, you're yeah. fine. Yeah. And, and you're going to find your way around better. Now, I do have a paragraph Bible. The reason I do is because if you have a Kindle Bible and you use text-to-speech and it has all the verses, 
then it goes one, then reads two, then reads, and it really gets old after all. <laughs> yes. So I use my paragraph Bible when I'm doing text to speech on the, because like I said, I'm cutting down. Actually, I was forced to cut down on uh, screen time when I lost my vision, and then I developed a little better listening ability because I couldn't see what I was reading, and so I still do that a lot. But that's the only time I don't want chapter and verses is when I'm using text-to-speech in a paragraph Bible. And so people jump on this verse 1, and they're like, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. How many of you heard it quoted, and they stop right there every time? Yeah. <laughs> rarely, and I'm not saying never, but rarely do I hear people quoting this verse and not putting a period right there. Now, look at your Bible. Is it a little squiggly looking like, or is it a dot? Squiggly. Squiggly. Yeah. That means you shouldn't stop reading there. Because <laughs> what there is a condition on that condemnation, on there being no condemnation. It's who walk not after the flesh, uh, but after the Spirit. So first of all, uh, how many of you do realize that when the Bible uses the word condemnation, um, it doesn't always speak in eternal terms. There, it's not always saying if you're condemned, that means you're going to hell. Um, let's look at a couple of examples. Um, after, I want to go ahead and read verse 2 just to keep it in, in the flow. Read verse 2 with me. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So that's the principle... And the fact, when it comes to your spirit, your soul, you are saved. And you are set apart unto God. You are totally free. You cannot go to hell. Mm -hmm. But your body and your flesh, which you still have to battle, is not saved yet in the sense of it's not glorified. See, salvation has a legal aspect. Then there's a fulfillment of that. You're, it hasn't been fulfilled in you yet. And you should be very thankful for that. You're not going to spend eternity in that body that aches and hurts and can get coronaviruses. <laughs> and, but it's also the body that you, makes you say bad things and you think bad things. That brain is, is not a spiritual thing. The brain is a physical thing. And that's why you'll see... Wonderful people take a blow to the head or have a stroke or go into Alzheimer's and they'll cuss like a sailor. Why? Because the brain is malfunctioning. The person isn't the problem. It's the organ. Just like if you have a heart attack. Do you say, oh, that was, that was a really bad guy. He had a heart attack. Wicked. <laughs> no, you don't say that. It's an organ. It went, well, the brain can do the same thing. So you've got to be careful. I knew a guy uh, that... I walked up to him one day, started talking, and he just took foul. You know, I thought, whoa, he was, supposed to, he was a good Christian man. Then I ran into somebody else, and I said, hey, did you, have you seen so-and-so lately? Yeah, man. I said, is something wrong with him? Oh, yeah, and he started telling me. I'm, I was actually thankful <laughs> because the guy, he'd had a, a brain tumor, and um, he, I, I don't know what, if he had it removed later or whatever, but I, he ended up dying from brain cancer. So be careful, you know, you run up to somebody like that. It could be, you know, not wickedness. It could be a physical malfunction. Mm -hmm. But in your right mind, you have to battle that, and you can walk after the flesh as a Christian. You can, uh, you, you will still battle the flesh as a Christian. So look at uh, Romans 14.22. Go to Romans 14. In verse 22, and we're going to look at a few verses that show that condemnation isn't always talking about hell or the lake of fire. Anybody there? Yep, I'm there. Who wants to read it? All right, what's it again? Reference? Romans 14, 22. I can do it. Go ahead, Jenny. All ball. <laughs> Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Hey, see, can you condemn yourself to hell? No. No, you don't have that power. <laughs> it's above your pay grade. 
<laughs> yeah, thank the Lord. So here's an example of condemnation. But it's you condemning yourself in what it says, that thing which we allowed. We don't we get into the, the larger context, but that's just an example. And go over to James chapter 5 and verse 9. You get there and want to read it, raise your hand. James 5, 9. How's Alex Trebek doing anyway? Is he still on TV? Still? I don't know. I haven't had to watch TV in a while. Before. Yeah, He's same. Still on there. Yeah, good, good. Seems like a uh, he's a professing Christian, and he seems like a good man, decent, decent guy. As good as far as man goes. There's none good. I know. I'm going to get scripture thrown at me for that. James nine what? Five nine. Oh. My Jenny's going to read it. Go ahead. <laughs> Now, if that meant people go to hell, then there's a lot of Christians going to hell. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of Christians that, as it says, uh, grudge against one another. What are you, how are you condemned then? Well, number one, your conscience should condemn you for doing that. But also, others will condemn that kind of behavior, that kind of attitude. There, most of the real Christians that I know who don't go to local churches when there is one within driving distance, don't do so because of this. They, they hold a grudge. Somebody said something they don't like or whatever. A lot of times, I just don't like that preacher. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know it, it sounds funny to say, but you know, you don't have to like the preacher. <laughs> it's, it's what... Yeah, is he preaching sound doctrine? Is, is he teaching you the Word of God? You don't like the preacher? Then don't talk to him. Don't hang around him. I mean, seriously, you, it's not that you, yeah. you should pray about your attitude if there's something that he, if he's not doing anything, but there are some men who are rude. Past, how many of you know pastors that are rude? Yeah. yeah. Now, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not accused of being rude in personal conversation and everything, but I have people... You know, who don't like the way I talk and the way I teach. And I'm like, you know, they said the same thing about Paul. I'm not comparing myself to him, but if you don't like the fact that I don't sound like, you know, Robert Schuller in the Crystal Cathedral or something like that, get over it. <laughs> that ain't happening. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you should still love the Word of God enough to go to the church in your area, if there is one, um, that you can go to and hear the Word. The Cathedral is not the Catholic Church. Well, the building is. Yeah. They do have a they do have a crystal cathedral light version. His grandson is a pastor. I didn't know that. Yeah. That that church, they went back from that church. Yeah. Got the building the got Catholic bought church, by the Catholics. Yeah. And, a, and an archbishop is there because it's so fancy. Yeah, it's it was if you like that kind of thing, it was a big waste of money. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Doug. I, I remember when I uh, was was very outspoken about uh, salvation and stuff. I was talking to my family one time, and, and instead of complimenting me about you know what I was doing, it was I remember when you uh, you know you know pick a sin or something. You know, and, uh, it's kind of there. there, there yeah. No and wait, you, what do you do in that case? Well, I showed him the I showed him the Romans eight eight one verse and uh, you know that condemnation. I didn't know that uh, you know that you know because I I just give you this advice: if anybody ever does that to you, agree with them. Why would you disagree? You're right. That's who you were. That's who you were. Yeah, that's you know, a, that's, that's the point. Well, is that you know, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. I fully, I, I fully get it, but. You know, uh, I'm not the old old man anymore. The old nature, the old whatever. That's what I was trying. To yeah, think. but see, you don't want to go there because Why? you you are the old man all the time. What? You you we all are still the old man all the time. The flesh, in the flesh. Yeah. So you don't want to base it on works. You don't want to say, oh, but look at me, I'm I'm changed. No. no what you say is that God, I am a sinner. I used to get drunk or whatever they were accusing you of. 
and I'm saved now and I don't want to do those things. And if you ever do see me do those things again, then God, as my Father, will deal with me, but I'm, I'm saved. Yeah, so you tell them the only difference between you and me? Saved, not saved. I mean, I'm still no better than I was as far as Greg, but I have the Spirit of God in me. And remember I talked about last week, somebody said, you know, I could have got real puffed up. They said, you, I was, I think I was about 28 years old. I, I just remember this. It always stands out. You're wise beyond your years. <laughs> it's because they had relatives in their 20s that are just acting like they haven't got any brains, you know. And they here I am pastoring, 28 years old and all that. And, you know, I would speak wisdom from the pulpit. Man, don't get fooled. It's, I got a book here. <laughs> uh, any, any wisdom you see out of me is the book. I believe the book, I read it, I put it in my heart that I might not sin against God. I, you know, I, I preach the word, the word, it's not Greg's word, it's God's word. And that's my point is, uh, I, I went through a, a period of time where I had to kind of change my thinking on, on that, but I'm telling you, if you can think it through, if somebody ever comes up to you and reminds you of your past, agree with them. And use that as the point to show them that it's not about me. Yeah, well, what, I, what I was doing, doing was kind of explaining that I am now, uh, I don't know how to say it, but the righteousness of me is through what Jesus has done. On the His righteousness, yeah. yes. Well, what he's done. Yes. Not me, I didn't do anything. But now the context of our verse, let's go back to uh, Romans. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1. And the context is that if you walk in the flesh, you're saved, but there is condemnation. See? Yeah. And uh, we won't run all the references again. We've done it several times, yeah. and I think uh, just last week. Yeah. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says you're, uh, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. If you start to fornicate with that temple, yeah. you're liable to die of AIDS or hepatitis. Right. You smoke pot or just smoke cigarettes like a freight train, uh, it won't send you to hell, but it could kill you. You're defiling that body, and it could, and that'll, you could die emphysema, lung cancer, whatever. I think that a lot of the pot and other drugs is causing the increase in cancers yeah. and uh, and and out even not just in the lungs but brain and everywhere uh, if you get in the flesh on a motorcycle and go 100 mile an hour and lose control you probably will die you could have been walking in the spirit right up to that day and then for some reason you make the choice to not only, there's nothing wrong with riding a motorcycle but especially if you ain't got a helmet on and you decide to get out there in the flesh, because don't tell me you can, you're doing it in the spirit when you're going 100 mile an hour. <laughs> you're in the flesh. Amen. And the condemnation would come as in a ticket if the cops catch you. Your conscience should be condemning you in the meantime, mm -hmm. and you may die. <laughs> See where I'm going with that? That's what this is saying. Now, I'm sorry that you and I, this includes me, have been taught wrongly on this verse. But it is what it is. That's why we're here. Uh, none of us know everything. Amen. Um, some of you are, it's a, it's a, I know I'm breaking news. <laughs> but we have a lot to learn, every one of us. And I tell people all the time, the preacher has one, only one uh, thing over you. And that is, he's the one that prepared it. So I was learning as I was preparing. Now I'm sharing it. And you're, you should be learning. But there's times where as I'm sharing and I'm thinking, oh, here I, let's say I do come up here with this attitude, I'm going to teach these people something. <laughs> and then as I'm talking, or maybe a comment coming back in this context, I learn while I'm teaching. Right. Even as I'm teaching what I've already prepared, I learn. And um, then uh, Jenny will tell you, you know, uh, I, I work and tweak on the messages right up to the time this morning while we're in the car. <laughs> so, uh, 
That's the idea. You, I just want you to understand that context as we continue. Uh, read verse uh, 3 and 4 now. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So you have the legal reality that you are righteous before God eternally, but you have the practical reality that it really, sin in the life of a believer um, serves more than one purpose really, but one of the purposes that it can serve is to remind you. When you do sin, not only should you be uh, feel the conviction, your conscience should bother you. You should confess your sins to God and only confess it to a person if you sinned against them. All sins against God, but if your sin involves somebody else, you should confess that fault to them and make it right. And then you should think about it. That's why parents, they catch the kid with the hand in the cookie jar. They smack the hand, and then they send him to the room, and you think about what you just did. Why? Because the goal isn't to catch them as many times as you can and smack them. That's not the goal. Mm, I'm going to get them. What you'd rather do is not have to get them, amen? So when you punish a child, the, your goal is, I don't want you doing that. Stop doing it. Now go to your room and think about what you did. And... That's the goal God has. When He chastises you, it's the idea to make you stop what you're doing. But a lot of people don't really sit and think about what they did and why, and so that's why they keep repeating. Sometimes it can be people you're around. Things you're feeding your head with. I believe a lot of women have left their husbands because of the crap Christian women read in Christian publications. I've read some of it. They'll put these women in there who have been divorced. And they, of course, you want people to go beyond divorce, and some of us have been through that. But you don't want to make it look like divorce is no big deal. What you want to make it look like is divorce is horrible. God, and by the way, do you know, the Bible never says God hates divorce. Have you read your Bible? <laughs> because Christians are always saying God hates, he hates according to, uh, is it Malachi? I always get Micah and Malachi mixed up. Malachi says he hates the putting away. What's that mean? In the context, it's a man putting away his wife without biblical grounds. That's what God hates. He hates these no-fault divorces where, you know, just like, I just don't love him anymore. Well, you know, where does the Bible say you should divorce somebody because you don't love them anymore? Now, there are reasons to get divorced, and I get criticized for this all the time, but it's uh, adultery, uh, abuse, or abandonment. And I get that from basically 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul's epistle to us. Read that sometime. But there are other, uh, you know, um, some people, I can't get into a, a long thing about that, but when you divorce, you are, and you've done so for biblical reasons, then you should tell people, you know, the Lord got, got me through that. The Lord's given me a new life. Uh, he, it, you know, I, I met Jenny, got married, have moved on. Some of us can testify that the Lord has wonderful things in store for you after you go through that kind of thing. But there are people in Christian ministry and in the, in the music industry who divorced for either the wrong reasons or they caused the divorce by adultery or something like that. And then they just turn around and talk about it like, oh, you know, um, it's just a chapter in my life. And what, first of all, in, if, you're go if you're going to talk about it, then the first thing should be to lament that you caused a divorce. And they don't do that. And... They basically, I've read the magazines where the women uh, talk about how they left their husband. They didn't give biblical grounds for it. They just left their husband because they just got tired of it. 
and uh, they give all these flowery reasons why. And so then other women read that and they think, oh, they're accepted among Christians. They're maybe even Christian leaders who do this. So I think the grass is greener on the other side. And that kind of thing happens. And what we're, what we're talking about here is that as far as God's concerned, there's condemnation in that. A good example is um, Benny Hinn when he got on his TV preaching saying, my wife left me. I did nothing wrong. No, you were with Paula White. Right. That's you one good... be a female preacher. One big example yeah. right there. Which that, that's a wrong thing in the first place. And then yeah. doing what he did with her and then saying that he did nothing wrong and that his wife left her for no reason. Yeah. She had great reason to leave him. Right. And there's great reason for him not to be in the pulpit. Yeah. And there should be condemnation in his conscience if he were a saved man, which I doubt. Someone who's that big of a con artist, I really doubt. But there should be, and there should be condemnation. Now, when I say that, it's not that we're just going to, you know, hunt him down and scream at him in public and, you know, that kind of thing. But we should condemn that sin. You should say it's wrong. You don't even have to use the word condemn. People are, if you say that is wrong, you're condemning it. That's all that means. And so when you walk in the flesh, your conscience, but also anyone who loves you, will condemn that sin. Now, you notice the condemnation, it doesn't say you condemn the person, you condemn the sin. And in all those references, the two references we had, it was talking about the, the actual sin being condemned. And... Uh, Again, the qualifier in verse 4. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, after uh, what I've heard three decades now, that Bible verse, verse 1 in particular, misquoted, um, you know, it does us well to test the way the Bible is used by other Christians. I mean, there's a passage where Jeremiah says, I know the thoughts I have for you, and um, thoughts, I think, towards you. Yeah, and he's talking to people that he's about to kick out of the land. And he's told them if they don't go with Babylon, he's going to kill them. That's the context. Yeah, and that people just take that and fling it up against the wall. Does God have a wonderful plan for your life? Maybe, but He might have a plan for you to die as a martyr, and it could be a horrible, painful death. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality. Well, that's what we're here for. Yeah. I, I, the first time that came to me was when I bought a little uh, thing for your desk. And I bought it for somebody as a gift. And um, he didn't say anything at the little party we were at. And then he come up later and he said, you ever look at the context where that verse is? <laughs> I've, I've read Jeremiah, I don't know how many times, but it didn't stand out as, oh, that's that verse. You know what I mean? you got to connect the dots. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's the exercise we're in. And I know from your, you've already told me, whenever you're in churches, well, that's how they use the Bible. You go to church and it's just, you, you, you don't know what you're going to hear when you walk in and they're just going to take a Bible verse and go... You know, well, it, you know, it's, it affects you. And I've gone to churches where the people get up and testify about, we talked about it last week or two, opening the Bible and just point. So what do they do? When things get rough, they open the Bible and just point. And that can be very dangerous. Go do that likewise. Yeah. <laughs> And and that is uh, most of the people who come through this these doors into this congregation um, who have come from other churches. 
They well, Doug, you were just talking about it just a little while ago. But Doug, when he started coming here, he was saying how, you know, uh, he had a he one good preacher he, he talked about, but as far as teaching the Bible, going verse by verse through books and everything, he'd never found a church that did it. And that's why I tell people all the time, online or on the radio, who may not ever attend here because of distance or whatever, if your pastor is not fulfilling his role by doing that, you still have a responsibility to read your Bible cover to cover. You don't have to go from Genesis to Revelation, by the way. Uh, you can mix it up. Jenny and I, our Bible calendar over here, we go Genesis, Matthew, Exodus, Mark. You know, it goes back and forth, Old Testament, New Testament. Because I'm here to tell you that the Old Testament can become a grind. <laughs> yeah. and, and I like how my cousin, uh, Kurt, uh, Miller, uh, he said one time, we were talking this a few years ago, we were chatting on Facebook together, and he said something about where um, if, he, if he goes just through the Old Testament into the New Testament like that, he just starts to long for the water of the, uh, I can't remember the exact phrase he used, but it's just like you start to feel a little parched in those genealogies and such. Now, there, I can take them in chunks, you know, one book at a time, and then go. To, then you go back to the New Testament. It's like, ah, oh, it really is like a f nice, cold, clear, clean glass of water in the New Testament. But anyway, you you still should go through the Bible if it's once every three years. It's according to your mental condition, your ability to read and understand. Don't let anybody let you feel bad about that. If you're just lazy, that's another thing. But. Uh, only by then understanding the Bible in its context will you really get what God intends for you. And some of the folks I'm sure listening online and listen to this months later, wherever, are going to know that they have heard that verse rarely taught in its context. Mm -hmm. And no, we could go on and on about all the Bible verses that are taken out of context. We've uh, mentioned that on other occasions. But uh, verse 5 we will continue now and close up in the next few minutes. Uh, read verse 5 with me. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, if you're going to sit here this morning and pretend that you're always in the Spirit, then uh, we're going to nickname you Baloney. Uh, would that we all were. Yeah. Remember Moses, you know, anointed of God, came down off the hill. Is he was actually in a temporarily in a glorified state. Yeah. He came down off the. They had to cover his face with a veil because it shown. glowed. Shown. Yeah, shone is the right word. So you see that movie Charleston Heston had a suntan. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's movie theology right there. But what happened to Moses? He destroyed the Ten Commandments in like two seconds. <laughs> He'd get in the flesh on a dime. And he wasn't allowed to go to the promised land because he struck the rock when God said, speak to the rock. And destroyed the picture of the water coming out of the rock, not by works. <laughs> and But then, remember when they came to him and said, there's these guys prophesying in the camp. Want us to make them stop? Moses said, no, would to God that all God's people were prophets. <laughs> you know? And that's, that's exactly how God feels because one of these days, we're all going to be like Jesus. It says, we will be as He is, for we shall see Him. Because you can't be in His presence in His glorified state if you also are not glorified. And that's God's will. And so in those moments when we're in the Spirit, and we're really walking in the Word and will of God and doing what He wants. That's a tiny taste of God's will for us eternally. But it don't take much to turn us into the flesh. And so... Um, when you mind the things of the flesh, what are you going to do? Sin. 
And that upsets a lot of Christians. They want to believe that we're going to reach a point where we never sin again in this life. It's just not going to happen. It's our, it's our desire. We would that we would never sin again. But we covered that in the, what I call the do-do passage in Romans 7. I do that which I would not. That's the story of our life. And um, if you're saved and walking after the flesh... In reality, anytime we do that, we are a walking contradiction. Because as Doug said, we are saved, we have the Spirit of God. And if we really, really surrender totally to God, we would de we definitely sin less. And sin less and less and less. But when we don't walk completely surrendered to Him, get in the flesh, we're a walking contradiction and we lose our salvation and <laughs> going to hell if we don't get things right. <laughs> That's what you're going to hear. The, all, all kinds of churches around here are going to have altar calls, pulling people up to get saved. They've already been saved a hundred times. And um, retreads. retreads, yeah. And then they, and they'll go on their internet and say, uh, even in the midst of the coronavirus, God is blessing. We had 25 souls saved. And, you know, I like when they say, and two of them were first timers. Wow. <laughs> You'll hear that. That's, that's what happens when you teach you can lose your salvation. And, but this, uh, that explains why God warns of such drastic repercussions because we are a walking contradiction. We're a bad testimony. And so if we persist in that, um, we get in his way being a witness. We are a reproach to Jesus Christ is one way of putting it. Read verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And uh, remember, go back to... Uh, Verse uh, 5 in chapter 7. And it says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto what? Death. Death. Now, uh, as the unsaved man, that means he's going to hell. That's what, if you're unsaved and you remain carnal and don't submit to the Spirit, you're lost. And uh, so what about if you're a Christian? You just think you can live like the devil. <laughs> uh, I lied I, earlier. I'm going to go ahead and I want us to go there and read it. First Corinthians 3, what I quoted but I just want to make sure, I don't want to take for granted everyone remembers this. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Read that with me. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple are ye are. So, you literally could die as a result of the uh, choices you make in the flesh. And we already talked about that. But it says, but to be spiritually minded, back in uh, our Romans passage, verse 6. If I can get there myself. Verse 6. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Look down. We're going to read it again probably next week or two. But look in verse 14 right there in Romans 8. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. But if you are saved and giving into the flesh, you certainly don't look like a son of God. You see that? And the Christian being spiritually minded means eternal rewards. If you go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 3, I should have had you read this while we are there. Look at verse 17, 18, after it warns that you could be destroyed. And 
In verse 18, it says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. And you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking of a different... Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It just happens to be the next book. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17, you know. You've heard this quoted. And uh, you could paint this on your wall and it wouldn't hurt a, a bit, Bethany. <laughs> <laughs> wow. now, the, now the Lord is that Spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. 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 Read verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. There you go. So as a Christian, to be spiritually minded means rewards in addition to eternal salvation. So it's like, I mean, you see those spirits still shining in the layers when the light hits it, it amplifies it. And it's not, I guess that's what we are. We are the glass and it just shines. Well, that, that's why the moon is said to be uh, represent the church. The sun, S-U-N, represents the sun, S-O-N, rising in the morning. Sunday morning, he rose from the dead. The moon is nothing but what? The reflection. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, you'll see that in typology. Huh? Yeah. All right, we got to close it up, but I want to read verses 7 and 8 in conclusion there in Romans 8. We'll close by reading those verses, and that's where we'll pick up next time. Read those with me. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You, the unsaved man will never be saved if he doesn't submit to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and the Christian will not please God when he's working in the flesh, and uh, you'll lose reward, etc. That's where we'll pick up next time. So let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time in your word, and we thank you for those able to be with us here and able to join online. We pray for the upcoming time of singing and fellowship and Bible study. Just a wonderful uh, gift. We appreciate and we love it, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 See the live streamers in a few minutes if you want to come back. Yep, see you guys shortly. Bye.